And now, The Travel Show with Arthur and Pauline Fromer. Your chance to talk to the publishers of the nation's best-selling travel guide series. Whether your travel destination is around your corner or any corner of the world, the Fromers will help you get the most out of your travel experience and save you money at the same time. Have a travel question? Call the Fromers at 855-300-0080. And now, Arthur and Pauline Fromer. And thank you so much for sticking around for this second hour of the travel show. I think you're going to be glad you do because we have with us in this hour in the studio, he stopped by appropriately enough on the way to the airport. His name is Lee Abamanti, and he is the most well-traveled gentleman, American gentleman under the age of 35. He has been to every single country in the world. So welcome, Lee. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for having me. Great to meet you both. Well, I guess the first question is, how many countries are there in the world? And is there any discussion about how many countries there are? I mean, is that at all controversial? Yeah, there's definitely some controversy about it. Technically, if you go by the United Nations, there's 193 countries in the world, like UN member states. Uh But then a lot of people say there's 196 because they add in the Vatican, Kosovo, and Taiwan. Ah. And then there's other lists. Uh, The most highly accepted one is the Traveler Century Club, which actually has 324. They call it countries, but it's technically countries plus unique destinations. For instance... French Guiana or French Polynesia or Martinique counts separately than just going to France. It's the same as like going to Guam or Uh. Saipan or Puerto Rico counts differently than just going to the continental United States. So in making up your own list, which one did you use? How many have you been to? Well, I've been to all 193 and 196, and then of the 324, I've actually been to 312 currently, and I hope to finish that list this year by December. So you're on the way to the airport. Are you on the way to a new place or not? Well, I'm actually on the way to London to go watch some soccer games and go to a couple conferences in Europe. (laughs) And how do you bring all this about? How do you finance this endless peregrination? Is that the word? Yeah, that's a good word. (laughs) This peregrination throughout all the world. Well, I've been working basically my whole life. Uh, A lot of people think I just kind of came for money, which is completely untrue. I uh, actually started a paper route when I was six years old. I had a landscaping company. I started with my friends when I was nine, did that all through school. And uh, then I started a technology company in college, sold that after school. And then I was a banker on Wall Street for about eight years. And then basically since 2008, I've been doing what I'm doing full time with my website and uh, just doing speaking gigs and, and television. You, you saved up enough money from your job on Wall Street to finance these how many years of traveling? Uh, it was 13 years actually to go to all the countries in the world. Yeah. You haven't li- used up your, your nest egg. Uh, no, no. I've been working uh, the whole time actually through it. And uh, again, I've been working since I was six years old. Wow. Wow. I think that's probably a real inspiration for people who feel like they can't afford to travel. (laughs) I hope so. And whenever people tell me they don't have any money to travel, I I just give them an example. Like I didn't I wasn't born with money. When I was six years old, I was working for like 15 bucks a week, throwing papers on people's lawns. And then I started shoveling driveways in Connecticut where I grew up for 20 bucks a pop uh, until basically I was 18 years old and went to college. So. Yeah, yeah, I guess it can be done. And and uh, when you travel, how do you choose what's going to be your next destination? Well, when I was trying to go to every country, I would basically pick regions and I would try to go to several different places at the same time, basically. Like, for instance, I did a three-month overland trip in North Africa, or I'm sorry, West Africa, from Mauritania to Nigeria, and I tried to hit all the countries in the three months I was mm. over there. Because it's not the easiest place to fly to. It makes it cheaper. And, uh, you know, certainly it's not like the kind of place you want to fly to a couple times a year. Yeah. And if you're doing an overland trip in those countries, I mean, would you just spend one day in the country or did you did you think, well, I really have to get the flavor of the country? How would you do that? How would you? As the story goes, if you've been to Chad. One day is enough in Chad. (laughs) However, if you go to certain places like Mali, for instance, which is one of the most fascinating countries in all of Africa, you've got to spend a couple weeks there because there's so much to see and do. And it's such a big country, you know. But certain countries like Benin and Togo, maybe you, you know, kind of skimp on the days a little bit. But there's not a ton of interesting things to do. Um, But if you're in like Sierra Leone or uh, Liberia or Senegal where there's a lot to do, you know, you spend more time there. So you kind of have to pick and choose. 
But I mean, you know, it's not like I get there and I just sit in the hotel and don't do anything. I go out, um, I hardly ever sleep, and I just go and do whatever there is to do, see what there is to see, eat at all the local places, and just try to do whatever I can in the time I have. We're on the air now with Lee Abamanti, who is who holds the record as the youngest American to have gone to every country in the world. He has a wonderful website, leeabamonte.com. Can you spell that for our listeners? Yeah, it's uh, Lee, L-E-E, Abamonte, A-B-B-A-M-O-N-T-E.com. And yeah, I like to keep it simple. Facebook and Twitter is the same. So when you, you, you've gone to a lot of countries, you've gone to a lot of really exotic places. And I think one of the names in travel that symbolizes exoticism is Timbuktu. I want to know what was Timbuktu like? Well, it's funny, the uh, the West African trip that I just mentioned, Timbuktu is actually the number one place that I had to go. I mean, if something happened, like there was a war that broke out or whatever it might be, Timbuktu was the one place I was making sure that I got to. And uh, a friend of mine did that, and we spent a couple days up in Timbuktu, and it's not the easiest place to get to, as you might imagine. Right. So, it's on the edge of the Sahara <laughs> Desert, right? It is, yeah. It's a, like a former desert outpost. At one point, it was you know known as like the crossroads of the world, and now it's essentially just a, a barren, dusty town. But um, there's actually an airport there. You can take a boat up there from Bamako. Um, and other places in Mali, like Jene and uh, from Dogon What do country. you do once you're in Timbuktu? So um, <laughs> once in Tum- Timbuktu, uh, you find a place to stay, which is a lot harder than you think it is. And then um, a lot of times people camp in the desert out with the Bedouins. So that's like kind of the main tourist attraction there. Mm. And it's in the Sahara Desert. Right. So, you know, but you- are there any remnants of its glory days? It used to be a center of the uh, Silk Road, right? Um, it is kind of like a little bit past the end of the Silk Road, actually. What, what they were known for was um, like these mud mosques. And uh, so there's still remnants of those. Actually, the world's largest mud mosque is in Jene, which is a couple hundred miles from there, which I also visited, which is beautiful. But in Timbuktu, they still have um, kind of the ruins of them. And you can see it. But the main draw is definitely just kind of the name and just getting there. <laughs> I guess Lee, so. you also go to places that are generally regarded as being too dangerous to visit. You go to Libya. You go to Afghanistan. Uh, How do you protect yourself against uh, people who wonder whether you're a spy, whether you have some unusual reason for being there? Well, I'll tell you, I get asked if I'm an arms dealer more often than not. Even back <laughs> in America, I think I'm on one of those lists because it's a crapshoot whether I get held at, uh, you know, in quarantine when I come back in the country or not. Mm. But um, in Afghanistan, um, it took me a while to actually get the visa. But then once I did, I had to arrange a security detail. So I did some research and uh, I actually emailed my congressman. And uh, what ended up happening was he gave me the name of a logistics company that Like if congressmen or senators go over to visit the troops, they actually set up the security with this Afghan logistics company, which actually has an office here in New York. And uh, so that's how I did it. It was like uh, $300 a day. And uh, I had an armed guard, an armored car, and a driver who spoke English. It was actually pretty pretty excellent. Pretty cushy, it sounds like. Did you ever feel in danger when you were in Afghanistan? Uh, no, I, I actually never felt in danger. Um, I was totally safe. I mean, I actually played nine holes of golf, if you can believe it, in Kabul at the <laughs> Kabul Country Club. <laughs> I'd seen it on TV, and that was like my number one priority. Um, so, so I did that. I'm a big golfer. What I, about Libya? Was that did that feel safe? Uh, no, actually, Libya was the most in danger I've ever been in my life. A real funny story, real quick. Um, Libya was the last country that I had to go to to visit every country in the world, and I was supposed to go there in March 2011. But if you recall that time, that's when the Arab Spring basically broke out and, you know, the rebels rose up against Gaddafi. Anyway, so I was in Africa. I was actually in the Sudan and in Algeria, and I was planning to fly from Algiers to Tripoli, but it didn't work out because they closed the airspace in the airport. So what ended up happening was in August that year, I got an email from a guy I know in Cairo, and he told me that the rebels had taken over the eastern border of Libya. Lee, I have to interrupt you at this point. Uh, We've gone well over. No, we haven't. Nine minutes. No, we have 11 we have, 11. we have 11 minutes. Yes. Right. Continue, <laughs> Sorry. Lee. Please, please forgive me. No problem. Um, yeah, so I got a. Uh, uh, I was told that the rebels had taken over eastern Libya, and I was able to get into Libya from the uh, western border of Egypt. So I flew out to the nearest airport to the border, and I found a guy who spoke Arabic basically to drive me into Libya and translate and the whole thing. And he basically told me that I would go in under the guise of a humanitarian dentist because he told me that I had straight teeth. (laughs) (laughs) And so what ended up happening was there was actually some Chinese smugglers on the Libyan side who were moving fake cigarettes 
into Libya be, and then into Egypt because they didn't have to pay a tariff if oh. they went into Libya. So since the rebels controlled it and it wasn't the same arrangement they had had with the Gaddafi guys, they didn't want to pay. And so the rebels got upset, and then they started shooting at each other. Oh, my goodness. And we were like 30 feet away, literally. And uh, actually, our car got hit. I was in the back of a minivan with two people I don't know. And so we basically had to floor it in reverse, and then we had to wait three hours to make a long story short. And then we eventually did get in and uh, ended up going to Tobruk, Libya. Oh, my goodness. Did you go to the notorious Benghazi? You know what? I would like to hold that question because now we are coming to the end of our 11 minutes. But, Lee, can you stick around for another segment? Because we'd love to hear more this of your adventures. This is so fascinating, Paul. We yeah. have to ask Lee to remain at his microphone. Absolutely. I don't fly out for another th- three hours, so no problem. <laughs> All right. We'll be right back after these messages. And welcome back to The Travel Show. Thank you so much for tuning in. As you may have heard in our first segment, we have one of the world's greatest travelers here. His name is Lee Abamanti. He has he is the youngest American to ever go to every single darn country in the world. And when we left, my father was asking him if he'd been to Benghazi. So I'm going to open on that, Lee. The uh, the original intention when I entered Libya was to go all the way to Benghazi. But at the time, because of the uh, distress at the border, and I ended up meeting this family, uh, actually a, a Libyan dissident, the guy who got me into Libya, and he insisted that I stayed with him and his family. Keep in mind, he hadn't hmm. seen his family for 41 years. He oh. hadn't seen his mother in 41 years. And he brings a guest? And he <sighs> insisted wow. that I stayed with them. And not only in the town, like in his house like in their apartment it was a three-bedroom apartment and I couldn't say no I mean he wouldn't accept no for an answer so um, originally I was going to stay for a night and then head up to Benghazi but Benghazi is not actually really close Uh so anyway I ended up spending a couple days there uh, but then I had to get back to Cairo because I had to get back to the states for something so I was unable to get to Benghazi but it is on my list. Lee in addition to being into every country in the world you have also apparently been to every island in the world including islands that are not countries (laughs) and I was so fascinated to see that you went to Pitcairn Island in the South Pacific, the refuge and the safe harbor of Fletcher Christian, one of the great mutineers of history. Tell us about that. Yeah, Fletcher Christian was the original bounty mutineer, actually. It's exactly right. And um, I actually stayed in the sixth-generation descendant house of his, Tom and Betty Christian. And uh, Jackie Christian, who's actually the seventh generation, arranged my trip and was on the boat with me from uh, Mangareva, which is on the edge of French Polynesia. It's basically a two-and-a-half-day um, small yacht trip over to Pitcairn Island. And, um, yeah, it's it's quite a harrowing there, experience. There is a functioning community on Pitcairn Island. How do they earn a, their living? Well, if you say a functioning community, and you're referring to 50 people, um, <laughs> and there are about 12 houses, and, uh, yeah, there's four families. 50 people, are they're all descendants of the famous... Fletcher Christian? Uh, of the mutineers, there was four families. There's the uh, the Christians, the Browns, the Adams, and, and one other family. And, uh, you know, people have come and gone. Some went to Norfolk Island. A lot have gone to Australia and New Zealand. Um, so there's about the diaspora is about 1,500 people worldwide, but there's only 50 people that currently live there. Wow. How do they marry? How do they, uh, you know? <laughs> well, that's uh, always an interesting question. Um, you know, some of them go abroad and then they come back. They bring um, their wives back. And they bring back. somebody. Ooh, they um, don't probably know what they're getting into. <laughs> yeah. <they've, laughs> Although, uh, is it a beautiful island? Is it? It's it's a beautiful island. Yeah. It's not developed. Like, there's no paved roads or anything like that, except for the one road going up from Bounty Bay, which is the famous landing. Uh, they call it the, uh, the Hill of Difficulty. So they <laughs> paved it and it goes into the main town of Adamstown. But it is a beautiful island. It's only two miles by one mile, but it's uh, about 300 miles from anywhere else. Wow. Wow. Fascinating place. And you've been, obviously, to every country in Europe. There are some countries that get overlooked, and and we were talking before this, and you you said that you felt that Romania was one that gets unfairly overlooked. What's, What's fun in Romania? What's interesting about that country? Yeah, Romania is actually, I think, one of the most beautiful countries in Europe, and I really love Eastern Europe in general, and a lot of people still don't know much about, you know, what was behind the Iron Curtain back in the day, and a lot of people still think maybe Romania, you know, they remember the president being shot on national television Mm -hmm. when the wall fell, Um, but actually it's become a great place, and it's still actually pretty cheap, and the capital, Bucharest, uh, I would put it up against, um, you know, Budapest or Prague as wow. just one of the best towns, especially in Eastern Central Europe. 
and it's uh, pretty safe. Best and in what way? In terms of sightseeing attractions, in terms of food and partying, what? Well, food and partying, yeah. The, the old town is really nice. There's like these big, beautiful boulevards with like grandiose Soviet style buildings. So you still see the remnants of like what it used to be, but then you see modern hotels and mm. they've incorporated the old into the new. So they've kept the character that it developed over the last century, but they've really moved it into the 21st century. So it's really cool. But the best part of Romania is taking a road trip. Like if you go up to, into Transylvania, into the right. Carpathians. You went to the famous Dracula's castle, Bram. Uh, Bram not, Castle, yeah. Yeah, Bram yeah, we're Castle. we're home of Vlad the Impaler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that lives up to it, the hype. It's interesting to see. Well, it's certainly interesting to see. I think um, the most interesting place in Transylvania is a place called Sigiswara. Mm. And it's like, a, uh, it's like an old citadel town. And it's like one of these World Heritage Sites old towns, and it's just beautiful, like church spires everywhere, bell towers you can climb up with the uh, old school orange Eastern European roofs and just beautiful mountains surrounding. It's a beautiful place. Lee, where haven't you been? What, what remains? Have you been to Antarctica? I actually was in Antarctica in December. Um, I <laughs> what was, an answer. I, I never <laughs> expected to get that answer. <laughs> I, I'll tell you a long story really quick. I was actually on a South Pole expedition in December, and I went down with Prince Harry, you know, the Prince of England. Yes. Uh, he was down there with the walking with the wounded thing, and we ended up getting snowed in. And uh, so we were all snowed in at the same camp at the Russian base, no- Nova Lazarevskaya. So we were all snowed in, and we had 10 days, but they had like two months. But since he was the prince, he actually was given, him and his team had about 40 people, and there's only one plane because one was broken, which flies from the base to the South Pole. So they were given priority three days in a row, and then huh. when the plane finally became available, the weather started getting bad again, so they uh. couldn't fly. So we actually did not make the South Pole. So now I have to go back this December to try again. You're going to try again. Absolutely. Well, let me repeat my question. Where haven't <laughs> you been? Well, there's um, some really remote islands that I have not been to that are still left on my list. A place called Tristan de Cunha, a place called St. Helena, which is most famous for where Napoleon was exiled to and actually died. And uh, Ascension Island, which is like there's a NASA base there and, you know, the GPS um, base there. There's actually an Air Force base that you can fly from Bryce Norton in the U.K. or from the Falklands, which is a wonderful place, by the way. You're, You're determined to get to these places? Oh, 100%, yeah. You're, you're determined to do so. Do you keep a journal of your travels? Are you someday going to write them up? Well, he writes on his website. He's got a very well-known blog. Yeah, I keep yeah. Uh, I keep my site very up to date, and I pretty much write about everywhere I've gone since about 2006. And uh, yeah, I'm actually writing a book about all my travels as well. It should be out hopefully next year. Well, Repeat. give your website again. Yeah, it's uh, www.leeabamonte.com. Let's spell it again. That's a difficult word to remember. <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, L E E. A B B A M O N T E, leabamonte.com. Well, Lee, it has been such a pleasure having you on the travel show. Thank you. And I know that uh, we're uh, you're about to step on another airplane, but this time you're going somewhere a little less exotic. You're going to London. Which was actually the first place I ever went outside oh, of America. Really? Wow. Well, well, we can't thank you enough for stopping by the travel show, and you know, we wish Pauline, you I'm, continued I'm and safe travels. I'm convinced that the words, that the name Lee Abamonte is going to become famous. It's like like well, all the great got fans already. He's the Marco Polo of the 21st century. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you again, Lee. Lovely having you on the show. Thanks, guys. Anytime.